Hi, I'm James. And I'm Anthony. This Saturday bonus episode is a recording of an interview we gave on another podcast. Regular Words and Numbers episodes come out each Wednesday. What's up, All-Stars? Welcome to the School of Ireland. Today, I had the really cool opportunity to interview professors James Harrigan and Anthony Davies. Both of these gentlemen were for the Foundation of Economic Education, whose mission it is to inspire, educate, and connect future leaders with economic, ethical, and legal principles of a free society. During our discussion, we talked about a variety of topics that range from why is economics an important subject to study to what steps should a student take in order to be successful in college. We also discussed current events related to Corona and also whether or not a college degree is actually worth it. Now, I do wanna give you a heads up in that what you're about to watch will be a little bit different from my other content in that this discussion is structured more like a long form podcast rather than the typical fast cut videos that you're used to seeing. I also wanted to warn you that some of the audio at the beginning of the video is a little bit choppy, but eventually it does clear up. I hope you enjoy. So what's going on, gentlemen? How are you guys doing today? Very well, thank you. Better than average. Well, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Would you mind telling us a little bit about yourselves? I'm Anthony Davies. I'm Associate Professor of Economics at Duquesne University, where I teach economics and statistics. And uh, I, with James Harrigan here, co-host the weekly podcast, Words and Numbers. I'm James Harrigan. I'm the Managing Director for the Freedom Center at the University of Arizona. And I've done lots of other things too, which if you click through on a link with me, you, you find out all about it. But there's really no point in talking about it today. Thanks, Richard. Now, speaking of your podcast, Words and Numbers, you have a segment on your podcast called uh, The Foolishness of the Week. Do you have an all-time favorite foolishness of the week that's like PG level? You, you know, there, there's. I was putting together just recently the uh, for, for Chris, our Christmas episode. It was a montage of best ofs from the past year. And a couple of them were, were foolishnesses. One of them stands out. It was hysterical, actually, that um, some state had required that Domino's post caloric uh, caloric content and, and nutrition statistics for each pizza that it sells. But the way the law was written, it required one of these things to be posted for every single pizza. And by every single, I mean like a cheese pizza is different from pepperoni. Half cheese, half pepperoni is different. If you put anchovies on there, that's different still. And so somebody calculated, there was something like, 34 million different combinations, right? So they'd have to have a 34 million of these stickers and they had to be posted in the establishment on the wall. <laughs> it was astounding. So do you know what ended up happening there? It's astounding here is that, that in, in a Domino's, there's not enough wall space to, to post really almost any of them. Right. My favorite one was the, uh, the Utah that botched its tax rate. And ended up, you remember this, Ant, don't you? You remember the numbers on this? Yeah, they uh, some rural county in Utah all of a sudden had an extra billion dollars worth of prop property on its tax rolls. And, uh, it, and it resulted in, the, they, they thought that they had an extra $6 million worth of tax revenue coming in because of this billion dollar property. And so everyone went scheduling their budgets accordingly and they suddenly found out that no they don't have and now understand a billion dollar profit this would be like a the u.s steel building in this rural county in utah right and uh, they finally discovered what happened is happened is uh, someone must have dropped something on the keyboard when they were entering the tax numbers and a whole, whole bunch of digits went in <laughs> <laughs> so these are foolishnesses of the week uh, that's hilarious i think that one's my favorite so as you know, my YouTube channel is primarily focused on helping people learn about psychology, uh, which is the study of human behavior and mental processes. And you guys both spend a lot of time either teaching or at least discussing economics. So my question is, what is economics and why is it such an important subject? Economics is, is the study of how humans behave when they're unlimited desires collide with their limited abilities. Humans end up having to make choices. You don't want to give up everything, but you got to give up something to get something else. And so the, the behavior behind that, in, in a lot of ways, it's 
economics is divided into two, two sets, macroeconomics that looks at the economy as a whole, and then microeconomics that looks at individual consumers, individual businesses. And if, if you were to, to slice that further into what in my mind I think of as pico economics, that's basically psychology. It's what is it that causes the individual to behave the way the individual does. Why do you think it's an important field for students to study? Well, so James is here and James is a political scientist and and from an from a purely economic standpoint, it doesn't matter that much that you understand economics because what you don't understand, you'll get slapped with later on, right? Because the market doesn't tolerate errors, right? So if I go out and I spend more money than I earn, I can't eat next month. And I quickly learned that that's not something I should be doing. But when you bring in the political science, you have something entirely new now. You have the ability for someone who doesn't understand economics to impose his or her view of the world on his or her neighbor. And that create all sorts of mischief if you don't understand. For example, uh, we talk about things like um, free college. Tuition should be free. And everybody says, yeah, that sounds pretty good. Economically, it's a stupid idea. And if you don't understand the economics, your tendency is when you get to the political side to vote for this and say, well, yes, tuition should be free. And if here's a politician who's going to make tuition free, I'm going to vote for him. And before you know it, you have you have thrown your, your country, your neighborhood into chaos because you've forced them into a situation that is economically bad. And you didn't know that because you cast your vote without understanding the economics. Right. And economics is more or less the antidote to what young people are taught from kindergarten through 12th grade, right? The, the K-12 experience that they, they get, generally speaking, where everything is magic and you could just have it if you want it. And you're always told that you're wonderful and smart and everything is gonna work out just fine. Uh, economics, on the other hand, might have you understand that there are trade-offs to be made everywhere. And that if you want A, you may have to give up a little from B. And as you look at your life, you start to realize that everything is a trade-off. Right. Literally everything. Um, even if you only have to think, well, if I make breakfast, I have to get up early to get to work or to school and things, things like this. And when everything is a trade off and you, and you finally come to terms with that, you can act a lot more responsibly than, than you could have before. So for my money, that's about where it's at. And I think that dovetails nicely with Ant's second point. Right. Um, but with, without some kind of, of understanding of how the economic world works, you're more or less doomed to a life of poverty and, and irritation. So better that you learn. Yeah, or, or you're dooming your neighbor to a life of poverty and irritation. Uh, for, for those who don't understand that, what does that mean? Oh, well, this goes back to the idea of uh, you vote for policies that sound really good and actually Im impoverish people. A good case in point is a minimum wage. It sounds wonderful. Um, you vote for politicians who support the minimum wage and they enact minimum wage legislation because you voted for them. And what does it do? It helps some people, it hurts other people. But the people it hurts are primarily the people that you're most interested in helping. The people with low education, low experience, uh, this sort of thing. Now, speaking of trade-offs, I don't know if you guys heard about this one yet. Um, but apparently the drug company Moderna was able to develop the COVID vaccine back in January. They had a completed vaccine. Uh, however, the FDA delayed its release for approximately 11 months or so uh, so that testing could be completed to make sure it was safe. Uh, as we know, in the meantime, in the United States, thousands upon thousands of people have died between then and now. Uh, so as you guys approach the world with an economic mindset, um, and understand that there are trade-offs. Yeah, I just want to hear your thoughts on this. Yeah, no, it's, it's pretty simple here, I, I think. And most people tend not to think of this because they operate in, in a context where they just assume that the FDA is absolutely necessary and we would all die horrible deaths without it. And that's, I think, idiotic. There's no evidence to support that and plenty of evidence to support the, the other point of view. But what they want, what they, what they demonstrate that they want when they vote in favor of people who think this way about the FDA. I know that's a lot to unpack. Um, what they're really voting for is 
heavy testing in a regulated state. Right, so what are we going to know about medications that get developed for the United States? We're gonna know that they went through two, three, four years of all kinds of testing. And then after that did what they were supposed to do and didn't harm anybody in any significant way, then and only then can we get it to market. Yeah, let, let me jump in here. Um, the, the people at the FDA have what we technically call an asymmetric loss function. That's a fancy way of saying there are two types of errors that people at the FDA can make. They can approve a drug that's actually harmful, or they can fail to approve a drug that is helpful. And those two errors are not equally balanced in their minds, because if they fail to release a drug that's helpful, what happens? Well, people are dying of this disease, whatever it is. Um, it, in some way, the people at the FDA will take less blame for that because they can say, well, it's not the FDA that's harming these people. It's, it's this disease that's harming the people. And, and furthermore, look, if we release this drug and it's harmful, even worse things could happen. More people could die. And so the people at the FDA can point to the what if. Think of all these people who could die. And so they have this tendency to err on the side of holding back drugs rather than releasing them. Because look at the other side. If the FDA releases a drug that's harmful, you can see directly, this guy took the drug and he died and we have the FDA to blame for that. It's much easier to place the blame on the FDA when they release a harmful drug than it is to place the blame on them when they fail to release a helpful one. And they'll have a natural tendency, they're human beings, just like the rest of us, they'll have a natural tendency to, to avoid this, this one type of error because it has greater ramifications for them. Right. The real question is, do we need the FDA in the first place? Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah. Right. And, I, and I've told you and I've, I've told a lot of other people, when I lived in Iraq, I needed to get medications. And I, I was walking out of the building to go to the pharmacy and not, no fewer than three people stopped me. And they said, because, you know, everybody, there's a lot of rumor mongering over there. So everybody knew where I was going for the rest of the day. And everybody, three people stopped me and they all said the same thing. Don't buy the Chinese meds. And I said, why not? They said, they're, they're worthless. Don't buy them. If you, if you have an option, get Syrian meds. Those are great. Or Jordanian, perfectly fine, but no Chinese. And three people told me that. And well, what do you think I did when I got to the pharmacy? I dug in my heels and said, no Chinese meds. Right. And, and I really what it was, was an ongoing nationwide test that had already been concluded and everybody knew what the answer was. So it was real easy for me to take advantage of that local knowledge. And I think we overlook the possibility of this sort of thing here at the, in the United States. We want everything to be absolutely without risk and, and nothing is ever without risk. And, and notice we're, we're talking about two extremes here of having yeah. the FDA or, or not having the FDA. And I've had this conversation with many people and I lay out the arguments as James has just done. And, and what often people come back to me with is something like, but, but I feel more comfortable that there are, are government scientists who are testing these drugs and so forth. And to that, I give the following response. Okay, what about a hybrid solution? Keep the FDA exactly as you have it, and you have the government researchers using government money to do all this stuff and figure out whether the, 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 the drug is harmful, and drugs that pass FDA scrutiny get a stamp on them that says the government scientists approve this drug. It's not going to harm you. It's going to do what it says. That's it. And non-FDA approved drugs get a stamp on them that says this drug has not been FDA approved. It might kill you, and it could do it quite painfully and then put them both on the market and let the right. consumer decide. And right. what you'll have is the people who are more concerned will, will gravitate toward the FDA approved drugs. Other people, you know, particularly people who, are, who are, um, have a terminal disease and, they, and there are no drugs out there that are helping them, they at least have the ability to say, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll try this drug. Or somebody who can't afford more expensive drugs, there's a cheaper one over here, it's not FDA approved, but you know, it's just for a headache, it's not gonna kill me. And, and you leave, what you do is you put the decision making in the hands of the consumer, having the government, rather than make the decision for the consumer, give the consumer maximum information so the, the consumer can make the best decision possible.
happen. I think if we did that, you'd see all kinds of people opting for all kinds of options, right? Because only they can know what they're facing at that moment in time. And I like this idea a lot. I always have, right from the first time I heard you talk about it, because it seems to give government approved medications some sort of UL designation, right? Mm -hmm. We've had a look and this looks great. Now, do I always buy UL uh, designated products for my home? No. But sometimes I, I take a special look when a product is especially hazardous, when it could burn my house down, right? Things like this. And I like having full information at that point. And it's just one more data point, right? And it's a very meaningful one. But I don't have to take it. I'm not forced to use it. It's a choice. Now, um, psychology often gets in trouble because its experiments are really hard to replicate, uh, which is really important for any science, right? And as a researcher, you really want to have the same results every single time. Otherwise, you know, what good are your results other than knowing, other than knowing that that path does not work? And the reason psychology struggles so much at obtaining replicable re results is because people are different, okay? They behave differently. Uh, does economics run into a problem like this when they analyze or try to predict human behavior? Yeah, sure, sure we do. The, the way I describe it is as follows. Um, there, there, are, there are things that are deterministically true, and there are things that are stochastically true. The things that are deterministically true are true every single time, right? So four is bigger than three. Four is always bigger than three. You will never find an instance in which it isn't. And if you did run across an instance in which four was not bigger than three, you've upended everything we think we understand about mathematics. It's deterministically true. It's true every single time. And then there's the stochastic truths. They're true in general, but they may not be true every single time. For example, dogs are bigger than cats. Dogs are, generally speaking, bigger than cats. Now, you can find an example of a teacup poodle and a Maine Coon cat, and the cat's gonna be bigger than the dog, but we understand that that's an aberration. It goes against the, the, the average that typically dogs are bigger than cats. Economics is, um, and I would imagine psychology is as well, a, a science of stochasm. Things there are stochastically true. And so when I say things like, if you raise the minimum wage, you will get unemployment amongst low-skilled workers. Will you be able to find a low-skilled worker who did not lose his job when the minimum wage went up? Yes, you will. But that doesn't negate what I just said, because what you found was an aberration. You, you did not find the thing that is in general true. As a political scientist, I feel the need to add that people lie, <laughs> which, right. which makes things really hard, right? If you yeah. ask them a series of questions, well, there's no guarantee that they're going to tell the truth. And indeed, there's a very, very high probability that they won't tell the truth in all. Of it. And, and so you, you ask about replica, replica, replica. Can you repeat the test, right? You get the same yeah. results. <laughs> um, and, and minimum wage, I'll go back to as an interesting example. There are hundreds, quite literally hundreds of studies on minimum wage. And almost all of them, not all of them, but almost all of them point in the same direction that raising the minimum wage harms low-skilled workers. It's not perfectly replicable because you can find situations in which that didn't happen, but those are tend to be aberrations. In general, everything points in this direction. What about uh, the argument that humans aren't always rational? I feel like that gets thrown at economics all the time. Um, and, and how would you respond to that? Yeah, I, and that goes back to, to the stochastically true part. Um, economics does not require that humans be rational all the time or that all humans be rational. Um, economics works perfectly fine if most of the people are rational or alternatively, if all of the people are rational most of the time. Um, and, and that tends to be the case because what happens is we're living in this reality, right? And if if I'm irrational, I believe that um, I can charge as much money as I want in my credit card and it doesn't matter because it's just bits and it's plastic. And what happens very quickly is I become incapable of feeding myself. And, and now there's pressures, right? I can't raise a family. I can't you know, keep a, you know, a spouse, this sorts of thing. And there's a natural pressure that's going to, to make it very difficult for me to continue behaving this way because it's irrational. I have to pay a price for that. 
And, and so too here, uh, yeah, people will behave irrationally, but the cosmos will slap them very quickly for doing so. So in general, on average, people will tend to behave rationally. Yeah, you might want to explain in some kind of thumbnail sketch sort of way what, ec what economists mean when they use the word rational. Because it's not exactly apparent, right? And people might be misunderstanding the application of the term. Yeah, so rational means that, that you, use, you use the available information and, and you process it you know, correctly. And, and so, you know, when I, I think about should I go out and buy uh, stock in Amazon, uh, what do I do? I take account of the information. Do I go out and collect every piece of information? No, I don't, because even my, my choice to collect information is a rational choice. There will come a point at which I decide I have enough information, I've got to make a decision. Now, think about this. We do this all the time. Um, when you choose a spouse, right? You do the same thing. You go, you date people and you say you like this person or it's not working out. So you dump this person, you go find another person. And what are you doing? You're collecting information. You're, see, you're searching for a person who will make a good spouse. It doesn't make sense that you would go through all three and a half billion people of whatever gender you're looking for, right? Um, at some point you say, I, this is enough. I'm now going to settle down. And that's, is it, is it a perfect answer? No, but it's a rational answer in that you've taken account of as much information as you can in making this decision. So one thing I found really interesting is that a lot of students who take econ uh, at the high school level with my colleague will often say that the subject changes the way they see the world and how they approach life in general. Now, I'm asking you to kind of speculate on their behalf here. But why do you think some students say this after taking econ versus like English class? <laughs> James, you want to take a shot at that? Well, yeah, sure. I mean, we all talk about that economic way of thinking, right? But really, that's just a fancy way of saying trade-offs that you can't, you literally can't have everything. You've got to look around and make your best call. And I think it goes back in, in a lot of ways to what Anch just said about rationality, which always includes some sort of self-interest, right? Um, I want is typically the first thing that you say. And then you say to yourself, okay, what's that going to cost me? And sometimes we're talking about money, but other times we're talking about time. We're talking about, in the case of a spouse, all the people in the world who you're eliminating from your consideration, right? You, you might meet somebody a year after you get married who is absolutely perfect for you. And you kind of know that, right? But you got to make your call in the moment. And the economic way of thinking, I, I believe, changes students' outlook if they get it at the right time in their development, right? So if, if you're 16, 17, 18, right, the last three years of high school, more or less, and somebody comes up to you and says, okay, I know that everybody's been telling you since you were a little child that you can have it all. Here's the horrible secret about life. You can't, but you can have a lot. So go figure it out. Um, mm -hmm. That hits them right between the eyes in a way. Right? It alters the landscape forever if they internalize that message. And I think they should internalize that message because it reflects reality much better than you can have anything you want or, God help me, you can be anything you want. Another pernicious thing that's told to young people. You can't. Be, look, I wanted to be power forward for the Boston Celtics. Never going to happen. Right. Never going to happen. And everybody has that one thing. But you know, how long has your mother been telling you that you can have anything you want, you can be anything you want? And I'm, I'm sorry, but your mother's wrong. And, <laughs> and that's going to cause all kinds of problems in your life if you don't make peace with it. I think one of the things that, that I find that when students say that economics is a life-changing subject for them, and I hear this, you're talking about high school students. I experienced this just last semester with MBA students, right? People who are in their 20s their eyes opening to things they didn't realize before. I think what gives rise to that is, is in, when you study economics, you learn to take incentives very seriously. Incentives matter. And so I give you an example. This is the case with the MBA student when their eyes were opened. We were talking about um, building larger roads and say, you know, we're in the Pittsburgh area and traffic is horrible here and so forth. It's, you know, rush hour coming in, going out the whole business. And somebody said, well, look, why don't we just build wider roads, put, you know, double the road capacity. 
And, and my response was, um, in the long run, that is after you know a number of years, you're going to find that you're right back where you started with the same kind of rush hour. And the stu student didn't understand. I said, follow the incentives. If you expand the road so that now there's no more rush hour, what incentives do you give people? Well, people who were carpooling now have less of an incentive to carpool. People who were taking the bus have less incentive to take the bus. Uh, people who were delaying their commute to avoid the rush hour have less incentive to do that. So all of a sudden there are more cars on the road. More than that, people who are um, thinking about moving into the area, should I move to Pittsburgh? Well, they've got no traffic. Definitely, I want to move there. And all of a sudden, people, and before you know it, you know, and I said before you know it, five, 10 years down the road, all of a sudden, you've got all these more people using the roads. And how much more? Enough that you're back to the exact same situation you had before, just with wider roads. And that's people responding to incentives. Do you think that high school should mandate that every student take economics? <laughs> I don't think anybody should mandate anything. Sure, sure. <laughs> yeah, I, I think fix my I'm right there. there with you. Um, look, I think there are any number of students in a in the course of their education during the high school years who will absolutely not benefit from that, right? I mean, that's just true. I think I was one of them when I was in high school. I didn't pay a lot of attention to things back then. I was moistening a chair in the back row. Um, mandated, no. Offered, yeah, absolutely. And maybe even mandated for you know the honors track or, or the AP track, something like this, um, where you just have students who are more interested in learning at that particular point in their lives. But look, some people don't really get to learning until they get to college. Some people don't even get to learning there. So you, know, you have to take everybody's frustration levels into, into account as well, teachers and students alike. But for a certain subgroup of them, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think it, you know, speaking as a as a college professor and who I see students come in, um, one of my huge complaints about how we prepare high school students in this country is that we we tend to fill them with stuff that they don't need, that they're going to get in college. They don't need it at the high school level. Meanwhile, we're we're not filling with things that they really could use. I'll give you an example. My kids uh, were in the honors track in high school and ended up taking uh, advanced chemistry. So their senior year doing, they're doing stuff with valence electrons and stuff that I studied when I was in college, right? You don't need that level of education at a high school. Meanwhile, they didn't have a course in um, personal financial management. Right. That would have done them far better because that's not something they would get at college because at college, it's assumed you know how to do this, right? I think we'd be better off if our high schools taught students things that they needed to be needed in order to be educated citizens rather than teaching them things that will give them an extra year or two leg up when they get to college. Yeah, Ant, Ant complains about um, innumeracy all the time. Uh, from the other side of, of, of the coin, I want to tell you that they get to college and they have no idea how to write anything other than like a one page reaction. And even that is when you tell them you want a page, it's, it's as if you're telling them to tear their own hearts out. Yeah. Um, and you get, you get how you feel. I don't care how you feel. Yeah, I, I want care. you to think about this thing. Uh, and, you know, I remember that when I first started teaching, I, I would assign a 10 page paper, maybe three or four weeks into the term. And the wailing and the gnashing of teeth were unbelievable. It was just <laughs> unbelievable, uh, you know, that I would dare to, to ask. And I said, oh, just wait until you get to the final. That's really going to hurt. <laughs> um, but if, if you know how to think, you should know how to write. And if you know how to do those two things, you should know a bit of math. And that would make students very well prepared. And, and you're a psychology teacher. So I, I put a plug in for psychology. I think I think all sorts of things, a smattering of things, I do include economics there as well, political science, a smattering of things at the high school level to give the student a taste of all these various subjects yeah. is excellent. It's an excellent idea, but you don't need to go into whatever it is, chemistry three at, at, a, at a high school level. <laughs> I'll even throw in sociology on that list, right? Which is, yeah, sure. I think, a discipline that has utterly been lost. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's a drift in the sea. Um, but what could think about it? What could be more important than the study of human society? Hmm. That that should be the queen of the social sciences, and it it's just not because a bunch of lunkheads started teaching it and publishing in it over the years. But uh, you could see where that could be reclaimed by rational teachers 
dealing with pretty good students. You could get, you really get something there. I think psychology is a top shelf thing to introduce people to at the high school level as well, yep. because people don't understand how important and how pervasive it is. When you say psychology, the three of us know, okay, we're talking about every element of human behavior. Mm -hmm. But young people don't know that. They, they picture you lying on a couch and right. whining to somebody. <laughs> and you have problems. About how your mommy oh, yeah. didn't love you, right? <laughs> Which is not the case. So, yeah, I'm going to put a plug in for all the social sciences. Now, what is one thing you want a student to, like, what's the most important thing you want a student to walk out of a freshman level econ class with? knowing yeah i i would say these two things we've already mentioned um incentives matter and everything involves a trade-off every decision to do something is simultaneously a decision not to do something else right but if you take those two things and really think them through i mean i think what you what you're left with at the end is the assertion that young people students um need to be able to categorize things clearly but you have to actually be able to look at the world and understand what you're seeing for what it is, not for what you wish it were, right? Not for what other people say, but for what it is, because you can't make trade-offs until you know what the, what the categories are, right? You don't know what incentives even are if you can't categorize things. So I think the ability that, that front end ability to make sense of the world as you walk through it, that's something we can't teach them, right? We can't teach that. So I, I hope that we can teach them enough that they end up learning that because learning and our teachings are radically different. Hmm. Now, kind of switching tracks here, um, I'm willing to bet that most politicians have taken at least an intro to economics course. How do you think it is that individuals on both sides of the aisle can end up with such completely different views on how to best approach the economy? Um, is it that they're being taught different things or is it something else? I'll let Anthony answer this one in, in, in the bulk of it, but why on earth would you even say that? What, what evidence do you have that these people have been in an economics class? Fair enough. <laughs> yeah, so, but I, I kind of already know what Ant's going to say, so have at it. Well, yeah, I, I go back to, you asked you know, one or two things I would want students to know about economics, and this is one of them. Incentives matter. And you have to stop and ask, what is the politician's incentive? It is not to do what's in the best interest of society, which is what we always parrot when we think about these things. The politician's primary incentive is to get elected. His secondary incentive is to get reelected. And, and once you understand that, you understand <clears throat> that if I'm a politician and I fully understand economics and I, I understand that um, holding interest rates low is not a good idea for the long term, and yet the voters out there who are going to elect me, they all think erroneously that holding interest rates low for decades is a great idea. So what happens? I've got a choice in front of me because I can't educate them in a, in a 10 second soundbite, which is all I'm going to get. I can't explain to them why that's a bad idea, the low interest rates. The best I can do is say, elect me. And, you know, and you want low interest rates, I'll give you low interest rates. And I know that that's the wrong thing to do. And yet... I have to say it because if I don't, my opponent will, and then he'll get elected and we'll end up with low interest rates anyway. So I'd rather have low interest rates with me in office than low interest rates with the other guy in office. And what it comes down to is the ignorance of the voters. It's not a, the primary question here is not whether politicians understand economics, it's whether voters do. Yeah, it, it's interesting too, because politically, I can tell you that every campaign for reelection starts the day after election. Right. So House members, you know, they serve for two years. They're running for office for the next two years after they win the office. And that's going to lead to all kinds of perverse incentives. Right. All kinds. Um, and, you know, think about when you were talking about what you just said, Ian, I, I automatically flashed to the two guys who are um, under imminent attack from a bear. And one right. guy looks at the other and says, We've got to outrun the bear. And the second guy says, no, I just have to outrun you. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly right. Yeah. Which, which seems to be, you know, the heart of what you're saying here. It, it's unfortunate. But and I say this all the time, so much so that I want to I think I want to trademark the, the term, the, the phrase, you get the politics you deserve. Right. That that's. 
There is no way that doesn't happen. You always get the politics you deserve. And unfortunately, we, we have been irresponsible as a people for so long that now that's what our politics show. Right? It's a mirror held to us. We have a, a nearly $30 trillion debt to prove the point. Now, this is a big question. Is there a solution? <laughs> <laughs> or well, there, something? There, there are it's solutions. weird because I've been asked this question five times in the last two days. So, you know, uh, people are wondering all of a sudden, which I take to be a good sign. But <laughs> finally, <laughs> but yeah, yeah, there are there are solutions, but none of them are. Um, None of them are practical. It, by practical, I, I don't mean that they can't be implemented, but rather they won't be implemented um, you know, because of all the problems we've been discussing. What, what's going to happen here is you know, we talked about rationality before, and I said that if you don't behave rationally, the cosmos will backhand you and you'll be forced to start behaving rationally. That's right. And that happens at a country level as well. The United yeah, States yeah. Has, has been spending far more money than it has, and we're reaching a point where the loss of mathematics are going to catch up with us. And it's yeah. just not mathematically possible to continue. That's exactly right. You can't go to war against math. Math <laughs> always wins, right? It's yeah. like gravity in this respect. Um, but Ant and I, we wrote a series of articles about this, I think one uh, about a year or two after we first started writing together. And you know, drawing on the work Ant does with all the numbers, it, it was pretty clear, right? We, we realized that you would have to take all federal spending, literally all of it, and cut it by 15% straight across the board. That's step one. So you already know it's never going to happen, right? Because that's step one. Then you would have to hold that level uh, cold, absolutely cold, for six years. All right, so now you really know it's never going to happen. And after that, you could allow government spending to increase along with uh, roughly uh, tracking GDP. And if you did that, for a hundred years, so we're 106 years into this, or 107, then and only then would you be almost out of debt. Right. That's so when you ask, can it happen? And Ant says, well, it can. Uh, I'm here to tell you it won't. <laughs> no. It will not happen. I want to switch gears and talk about a topic that's relevant to a lot of my uh, followers on the channel. And that is what advice would you give a high schooler applying to college, especially if they don't have a scholarship? James? Yeah, I'm happy to start this one. Uh, there is, I would say first, there is absolutely no shame in going to a public school. Yep. Right? Go to, a, go to a, a big giant state university because, okay, is there a downside there? Yeah, you're not gonna get all the personal attention you think you want from your professors. The kids that go to the $50,000 liberal arts college, they're going to get that. But what's what's the trade-off? What are you going to get in return? And you're going to get a couple of things, too, I think, that really stick way out above the rest. You're going to be able to go through college if you work hard enough uh, without any debt whatsoever. And uh, people say this isn't possible. Nonsense. It's absolutely possible. Here in Arizona, the in-state tuition rate is $12,000. If you can't make $12,000 a year with a part-time job, I don't know what to tell you because you're going to have a lot of problems the rest of your life. So there's that. You, you get to graduate without a heavy debt load. And then I think more importantly and more often overlooked, you get to deal with world-class scholars, right? Because where do the professors want to go? They want to go to the big state schools. Why? Lighter teaching load, more of an opportunity to do research. So are you going to have a lot of personal interaction with them? Probably not, especially not your first and second year, but you're going to be in the room. And oftentimes that's, that's really quite enough. So if, if they can internalize these two things, they usually make the right decisions. If, if they can't, they, they just don't. The, the thing that, that I and James repeat to high school students over and over is that a college degree is not valuable. And, and this is shocking to them because everybody up to this point has told them, well, the key to success is a college degree. And here we are, a couple of college professors saying a college degree is not valuable. A college major, on the other hand, can be, but it depends on what that major is. And the returns, and I'm talking about financial returns. So what do you earn? The returns to a four-year undergraduate degree vary from $7 million 
we're, to people who have petroleum engineering degrees, all the way down to what ends up being negative. That is, students in, for example, uh, early childhood studies end up earning less than high school graduates earn. So there's a, there is a handful of majors that actually degrade your uh, value in the marketplace. Yeah, and and you know when you look at the the majors that don't do that, the majors that make you valuable, you're really looking at the STEM fields, right? Science, right. technology, engineering, mathematics. And when you look down to the other side of the distribution, you're seeing degrees ending in the word studies. Every, all of them, right? It doesn't matter which, but all of them. And there are conservative majors that do this and liberal majors that do this. This is not an ideological thing. Um, and Ant and I see it all the time, right? People come in and they say, well, I love art or whatever. And, and they say, well, you know, you should do, you should follow your passion. And I was telling them, you know, that's an idiotic thing that all kinds of people who don't know anything about anything have told you over the years, do not follow your passion. <laughs> what you should do is ask, what is it that I enjoy that other people value? Hmm. That, that's a different question. And it puts a finer spin on things. But if you can figure out that list of things that you like, and everybody's got a list of things they like, um, that would be valuable to society, or in, in this case, an employer, well, this is not a hard game to play, right? The grievance studies degrees, nobody, nobody wants you. If you're studying medieval poetry, good luck to you, right? <laughs> these are not good. You're not going to make a living with these things. But there are plenty of good, honorable majors that you can make a living with, and you should do your due diligence and figure out which is which. And, yeah. and that's not—that's not to say that you know, if your love is medieval poetry, you know, that that's fine. But you know, going back to to the thing about trade-offs in economics, go in with open eyes and understand that you're going to be so happy studying medieval poetry because it's what you love, but you will also be so unemployed. <laughs> when you graduate and, and when that happens don't come to the rest of us and say right. that you need your student loan forgiven because right. you chose this path the most annoying thing in the world is when people in large number start to refuse to take ownership of the problems they created for themselves hmm. there, there's no mystery here if you want to if you want to figure out if you're going to be unemployed the rest of your life walk into my office and give me a list of your five major choices and, and I can tell you quickly and with great precision whether you're going to be employed or not. You should and, start charging for that. Uh, <laughs> if, if I could get people to come in, I would cheerfully do it. <laughs> cheerfully. I always tell my students, you know, social studies is fun, but math will make you money. Yeah, uh, no, that's so. right. And look, <laughs> I say these things as a guy who studied philosophy. Mm -hmm. right? So I know, I know what the problems are. I, I was one of them for a very long time. And, and it come to find out philosophy is one of those top third or so majors. And it, it's the numbers there are queered a bit by CEOs. Uh, philosophy pays off late in life for a small subgroup of philosophy majors, um, mostly in, in executive positions in corporate America, because philosophy majors learned how to think rather than a, a thing to think. And that's actually quite valuable to a certain group of employers by the time those people are in their 40s. So, you know, a mixed bag to say the least. What tips would you give a freshman entering college so that they can be successful? Yeah, J James and I give a talk to high school students throughout the country. And th these questions you're asking are sort of the things that, that we go over. And one of the things we each have different bits of advice on this question. My advice is um, on a Friday night, instead of going out to the bars as students typically do, go to the library and find out who's there. Make friends with those people because, and students don't appreciate this, one of the, one of the most important decisions they will make as college freshmen is who they hang out with because you will develop the, you'll take on the, the attitudes and the priorities of the people you surround yourself with. And if you surround yourself with people who are going out to the bars on Friday nights, you'll develop one set of behaviors. If you surround yourself with people who are studious, you'll develop a different set of behaviors. And that second set of behaviors, while it may not look as flashy and as interesting or as fun, that's what's gonna help you to succeed. I do have a different point of view on this. Um, 
I would not advise you to go to the library on a Friday night. Uh, I would advise you to find those people who know that there's a time and a place for everything and, and who understand that it's perfectly okay to go out on a Friday night. It's not perfectly okay to go to a party every night. And you're going to have that option, right? There, there are parties every night at a, at a college. And you have to be strong enough to resist that temptation. And it's a real temptation. Um, and, and what should you do? Well, you should do your work. You should go to class, right? Don't skip class. I can tell you who's going to fail by the third week of any class. And, and this is the greatest indicator. Are they even coming? Because people who come to class, um, Oddly, because we have hearts, it, people don't believe this, but we do. If you come to class all the time and you've got an F average walking into the final, you're probably going to escape with a D. Uh, I'm just saying, right? If you're there all the time, it proves to me that you're at least trying to take it seriously. So go every day. And then there's this rule of thumb that has long been forgotten, but that remains absolutely accurate and true. You should be doing three hours worth of work outside your class for every one hour of class time there is. So if you know if you're taking 15 classes and you're doing the three hours, you're up well past a full time job. Now, ask students how much time do you spend studying outside of class, and almost all of them are going to say less than three hours per one hour. Some are going to say 20 minutes a week. That's yeah. not enough. That is absolutely not enough. Um, and trust me, I know who you are. It's real easy <laughs> to find you. Um, and and you, know, you have to be ready for college. College, Ant says this all the time, and I think it's absolutely true and a valuable thing to say. When you're in high school, your teachers drive your experience. They drive your education. When you're in college, you do. And if you're not coming to class and you're not turning in your work, I don't care. Why on earth would I care? That's one one less crappy paper for me to read, <laughs> right? I'm just I'm happy enough to just cross you out and give you an F and, and move right on. And at the end of the term, I get a lot of whiners saying, "Well, I don't know how I got this F," and I say the same thing: "Who the hell are you?" <laughs> and and if I can say that unironically to a student, that's why you got the F because you you didn't come. Now. In 20 years, do you think the college system will look the same as it does now? I, I don't know. My, my, tendency, my tendencies, because I want to say, no, it's not going to look the same. Um, having said that, the most intransigent, intransigent group of people on the planet are academics. That's right. So I, I, I can't see them. I can't see college and university changing because the faculty think it's a good idea. I see it changing because enough of them go out of business right. and get replaced with something else. Right, and I think you're seeing right now a movement on, uh, on the part of a good number of, of people who would have been college students. They're finally looking back at the trades thinking maybe I'd be happier doing this. Yep. Uh, that was something that nobody even thought for about 30 years, 40 years maybe. But all of a sudden, that's becoming reasonable again. Why? Well, because nobody has done it for so long that now you can make a small fortune by being an electrician, right? You can be actually, you could become wealthy by being a plumber. And that, was, that, wasn't the true, that wasn't true for a long time, but it is now. And I think that group that opts out of college entirely is going to further cause more colleges to go out of business. There's a ripple effect that's going to be felt from that. So I, I'm with Ant, but for different reasons. I think ultimately schools do go out of business and the smart ones will pivot when they have to. Um, the bad ones won't. I sort of piggyback off something you said. Um, I had a student a few years ago who uh, didn't even go to college, didn't even go to trade school, had enough skill and training to go right into plumbing. And he was making about twice my salary right out of yep. high school. It happens yep. very, very quickly. <laughs> it's like, right. Oh, man. Yeah, my, my son talks about these sorts of things. He's just naturally inclined to all things repairable. And, and I, I told him, you know, what the average pay was for these things. And, and it was, I mean, I might as well have hung that calendar on the wall so he could just check off the days until he could do it. Um, and, you know, you can, at this point in time, you can start at a, 
within a year or so make eighty thousand dollars as a as a plumber or an electrician you get up to six figures after a while especially if you open your own shop um, even automobile mechanics those high-end guys who work at the bmw dealership right they're making uh, crazy money too and they don't even have to get grease on their hands anymore the the engines are so clean um, and what we found, Ant and I, is that if you take a look at these sorts of things um, on that list of majors and career, uh, career returns, these all come in at about the top one third. So they're better. They, these people make more money than, roughly speaking, two thirds of all college majors. The odds are in your favor. right? Mm -hmm. They're really in your favor. Now, this question is kind of along the same line of thought as earlier. You indicated that, you know, some a college degree isn't necessarily worth it. But even down the line, do you even think, you know, a college major, even going to college will be worth it? Um, do you think businesses will start hiring more kids uh, who don't have degrees? Um, you know, the, the joke is, you know, there's YouTube University now. So right. what are your thoughts on that? You see Google moving exactly in this direction right now. Um, and look, we've long said that a college degree is a signal, and, and it is, right? It, it proves a few things. It proves you can put your mind to a project that lasts four years, um, and multiple people along the way who are cranky and difficult, and that you've negotiated that span of years with these difficult people, um, and you got this GPA. There's a lot of signal there, right? And you have to ask, well, okay, without that, what can you have? And I don't know what the correct answer is, but as luck would have it, nobody else does either right now. But some are emerging, right? That you meet certain people and they just look like they're already ready. And Ant, maybe you've you've got something more hard baked than I do. That's as good as I can do right now. Not much more, other than the observation. You know, while you're absolutely correct, you could someone who who wants to take the time and troll through YouTube can learn on his or her own everything that we teach at a college. Yes, the right. problem is that you've got to be a certain type of person, that you have the self-discipline and the, and the interest to do that. I think a large part of what the, of the jobs that we do is shaming you. That is <laughs> not direct, not directly, but indirectly of, well, you didn't show up for class or you know in the back of your mind, there's a class going on, I really should be there. And we become kind of an incentive to, to help the students to, to keep on track. I think one of the things that we may well see when you get hints of this at the at the MBA level is businesses go ahead and hiring students straight out of high school. And then, you know, after a year or so, sending them out for specific instruction, go learn statistics, go learn finance, whatever it is. And, and what we'd be delivering, we the academics would be delivering is not a major, not even a not even a minor, but rather a suite of these six courses. This is what you need. So kind of like tailoring the education to the specific person in the person's circumstances. Yeah, we've gotten out of hand over the oh the past thirty years or so with with all kinds of requirements to to get a degree simply, and a lot of people are simply not interested, right? And this is especially true of the computer science people. They really want to learn how to code and then how to go nuts coding. They, they don't want to learn Elizabethan poetry. I don't know why I'm always picking on Elizabethan things, but there it is. <laughs> um, they don't want to learn that. And, and here's the kicker. The people that will hire them, they don't care about it either. Right. And it, the minute you can say that about that interaction between employee and employer, all bets are off. Right. Because now they can they can really figure out what they want their people to know. They can even pay for it because it's generally going to be about six to 10 classes. And that's it. Right? And, and remember, you know, people will, will come back with, with the response of, well, but there's value in being an educated person in knowing about Elizabethan poetry and so forth. And I don't dispute there's value in that, but that's not what we're talking about. What we're talking about is the person who doesn't doesn't value that or, or, or values other things higher than that. It just wants to learn how to do coding or how to do statistics or whatever it is. The person who still wants to study Elizabethan poetry, that's there. All we're saying is we're not going to force the first group into the second group's mold. And notice how we've come full circle, right? Because trade-offs. Right, right. And here, and here we are again, right at the, at the, at the, where the rubber meets the road. 
Well, gentlemen, thank you so much for your time. Um, again, you have an awesome podcast. You want to plug that real quick? Yeah, absolutely. Wordsandnumbers.org. Come, come join the fun. Right. I listen. And, and Anthony will be there too. Right? <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much, guys. I really appreciate it. Our thank pleasure. You, thank you. It was, it was really great. Hope to do it again sometime. Thank you.